Can't Look Away, Dialogues on Photographs of the Civil Rights Struggle. I know the world is bruised and bleeding, and though it is important not to ignore its pain, it is also critical to refuse to succumb to its malevolence. Like failure, chaos contains information that can lead to knowledge, even wisdom, like art. As our series continues, Kenyan College scholars delve deeper into the history and legacy of the civil rights movement through images of remarkable moments captured by photographers who witnessed the demonstrations for racial justice of the 1960s. Engaged with urgent issues of racist violence examined earlier in this series, this subsequent set of discussions helps us understand different modalities of black Americans resistance to oppression. These dialogues offer us views of courageous assertions of human dignity in the face of insidious and brutal racism and highlight the unrelenting resiliency, strength, and beauty of African-American culture and community. In this episode, Peter Rutkoff, professor of American studies at Kenyon College, in conversation with Jody Kovac, curator of academic programs at the Gund Gallery, shares insight into the West African roots of the second line funeral procession pictured in Lee Friedlander's Young Tuxedo Brass Band, New Orleans, 1959, and shows us how it symbolizes the enduring vitality of African American life. Professor Rutkoff concludes with comments about Leonard Freed's photograph, Service for Colored, New Orleans, 1965. Let's join them now. Peter, when we spoke briefly the other day about this photograph by Lee Friedlander, the Young Tuxedo Brass Band, yes. uh, you illuminated so much about this for me, about what's going on in this scene. Um, I know a bit about Lee Friedlander, that he was involved in photographing the civil rights movement. Yeah. Uh, what he's most known for is uh, the, his photographs of the, pair, excuse me, the prayer pilgrimage for freedom. Um, that same year that he made that series in 1957, he made his first trip to New Orleans and visited New Orleans throughout his life and loved photographing urban scenes. He was really trying to capture the, uh, the social landscape through these really kind of visually complex photographs, yeah. multifigural compositions, um, lots of strange juxtapositions. Oftentimes there are reflections or street signs, something that's going on in this photograph. And during the 50s, he was also living in New York. He was employed by Atlantic Records and took a lot of very famous, iconic album covers of jazz musicians. So this photograph brings together a lot of his different interests and investments at the time. And I, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about the, what is happening in this photograph. Uh, I can, and, and I'll do it in a kind of narrative of my own. Great. <laughs> I, I, I took a group of students to New Orleans about 25 years ago, and I was with the other guy who could have been here today named Frankie Gourier, who's from New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know that much about the city, but at one point he said, somebody named Dr. Jazz is going to call you up. This was before there were cell phones, but he did. And Dr. Jazz says to me, take your class to Treme. I didn't know what Treme was. <laughs> Treme was the most... Um, shotgun housed black neighborhood of New Orleans. It's where a lot of the jazz musicians once lived. And, and what I, one of the things I discovered is that if you find Martin Luther King Boulevard in a city like New Orleans, you'll find that's where black folk people lived and where they built an expressway to get to move people out. Mm -hmm. But this was there. So we went to a funeral home in Treme, and a cortege leaves the funeral home, a coffin on, uh, on wheels, followed by a lots of people, and they're taking it to the cemetery. And about a half an hour later, you hear a jazz band, a band just like this, 
all playing brass, brass instruments. And I can tell you a little bit more about that later. They're parading back down the street, you know, instruments raised high and almost dancing. And they come to the funeral home where the clock on the front of the home has been stopped. A symbol of the end of the life of the, of, of the deceased. And they, they, as if imagine this group of people, they've walked, let's sort of follow them to their, to their left, to the front of the funeral home, and they stand in front of the funeral home and start playing. But not only do they start playing, they move into a circle. And in this circle, they, go, they start playing their instruments up and down and going in a counterclockwise direction. They form this amazing circle. And that's when the light bulb in my little brain went off. I said, oh my God, they are doing a ring shout. A ring shout is the fundamental dance movement of West African religion, defined by its counterclockwise motion and by one important rule Ring shouters may not cross their legs. If you think about the Charleston as a dance, think about what they're doing. Is they're giving the illusion of crossing their legs with their hands, but they're in fact doing a, a kind of version of that ring shout. If you ever have ever gone to an African American church, you'll notice that people walk down the aisles, clapping and singing, but they're walking in a kind of shuffle one foot at a time, not crossing their legs. They'll go down to the altar and back up the other way, again, a counterclockwise motion. In other words, I was kind of thunderstruck by the continuity of African, West African culture in African American culture uh, in New Orleans. And it just kind of floored me to, to begin to try to read it this way. So that's why this, this photograph means a lot to me. Um, if I have lots of random things to say, and you can interrupt it, but any, one thing to think about is the ways in which certain African American communities in the South retained West African traditions. The places where that was most profound were South Carolina and New Orleans. And those also happened to be the places where the civil rights movement in the South was the strongest. Mm -hmm. South Carolina Sea Island Voting Rights Project, which was created by a wonderful woman named Septima Clark, came out of that environment. And New Orleans has its own tradition of this dancing freedom. And the whole district around where this was taking place was called Storyville. Storyville was the New Orleans red light district. And the U.S. Navy shut it down in 1918 as a bad influence on their boys. And a lot of the Navy bands left their instruments. And they came into the hands, the tubas, the trumpets, the cornets of untrained New Orleans musicians. And it became then part of this thing. So it's so, it's, so interesting to me to think about where the, the dance comes from and where the music comes from mm -hmm. and where the instruments come from. And so what we learned to call Dixieland is really this kind of brass band music. Yeah. If you want to listen, there's a wonderful band called the Dirty Dozen Bass Brass Band that, that plays this kind of music. And of course, this is the music that the Marcellus family plays in the different uh, clubs in New Orleans. So, so, so to me, this, um, aside from the goofy um, signage, which I which I'm ignoring. Uh, We're going to come back to that. Okay. Though. okay. <laughs> but to, to me, this is this is the power of this. Um, you may or may not know this. On the Hanukkah dreidel are four Hebrew letters, which say a great miracle happened here. And I've always thought that the retention of West African culture in African America is that belongs to that idea. A great miracle happened here, that the culture of West Africa, which allowed terribly 
enslaved, beaten, reduced to inhuman conditions, allowed people to survive, that that tradition is part of a great miracle happening. And I think that this, this brass band tradition, and this is called the second line because it's the second line. First, they go down in a dirge to this cemetery. They play this happy music and come back and dance. Uh, in front of the funeral home. So to me, it's it's an incredible miracle that it's a sustaining part of African American culture. And 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 that he saw this, of course, is is a testimony to the man's sensitivity and his eye. Right. And that's what I would that's what I would say is wonderful. Yeah. You know, he 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 wanted he somehow captured a moment of miraculous celebration and power. I like that way so. of, of describing it because sometimes his photographs of street scenes, sort of um, things that, that caught his eye that might otherwise go unnoticed as just you know everyday occurrences or background noise even um, are re quite remarkable. And some have described his, his work or his images as as joyous yet um, haunting. Yeah. Um, there's something surreal about his portrayals of New Orleans. And I think that that evinces a lot of the unique character of that city. I think that it also shows the influence of some of the photographers he admired, like Eugène Ache, who is one of the kind of first um, street photographers who yeah. who took those um, very haunting this is photographs just me of Paris. Being, not knowing what he's talking about, but it seems to me a lot of the WPA photographers used signage as a way yeah. as ways of enhancing their their message and their and their meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, so we here we have this you know almost middle class white housewife drinking Pepsi in while the black band is is doing the ring shout. Yeah, it's, a, it's an ironic juxtaposition. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think so too. And uh, another thing that struck me about this was their, uh, how they're dressed. Um, is this indicative of, um, you know, this very formal attire? Is this indicative um, only of a, a second line uh, procession? Or is it common to see jazz bands um, you know, in the streets. In, I, I, in the I can't. I don't. I can't answer. That. It's a. Good, it's a good question. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're clearly also dressed for the rain. Yes. Um, yes, that's true. <laughs> that's true. And 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 the white hats make me think of them as some version of cab drivers. Ah. Uh huh. I don't know, but I would be. It would be interesting to find out if anybody who these people were and and what they did. This is a. This is another mm -hmm. aside. Uh, back to West African traditions. West African traditions have special qualities for red and blue. Blue is the color of water, in which case it's kind of magic and protective. Mm -hmm. But red is the sign of life and passion. Okay. And you know, you remember, you don't know this, you're too young. <laughs> the people who carried your bags and the trains were called red caps. So they literally wore red caps, and I think they were s symbols to other black people. This is a safe person you can trust, the red cap. So I'm fascinated by the white cap and what it means. I have no idea, but I think it's worth thinking about. I think so, too. I do know that this, this band, Young Tux Tuxedo Brass Band, is a band of some renown that was uh, formed after... Well, I think it was in the late 30s. Uh, well, and so somebody could do a little uh, Google search and figure yeah, it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all it takes. <laughs> but yeah. they, I think that the members of the yeah. band uh, I, um, changed. It, yeah. There were typically 9, nine to 11. Um, using but, you know, it, it, if, if my hunch about cab driver stuff, it doesn't matter if it's right or not. What's important is these are working class people. They are. Yeah. And, and, and I think that they were... Um, they were joining the band at different times. I don't know that they recorded much, but I do yeah. know that in the 70s, uh, this a version of this young tuxedo brass band, as it had evolved, uh, did record well, with great. Paul McCartney. Yeah, yeah. And I think that they're still uh, in existence today. 
Uh, so, I, I'm not, you know, part of the whole issue of continuity is, is makes it makes it very reasonable to think about that way. That's right. Yeah. 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 Um, so, do you um, do you have any sense of where in the city this would have taken place? Just by I, I'm the guessing it's on the neighborhood that I mentioned, Treme. Okay. Treme was also part of the Ninth Ward that was destroyed by Katrina. Okay. Which, of course, you know, national natural disasters always destroy where poor people live and mm -hmm. work. And in New Orleans, it's where black people live and work. And it's about, if you look up and down the road, you can see the sewer, the Superdome, which is just an awful, ugly, and imposing edifice. Yes. And, <laughs> here, and here they are on a, if I was to walk down the street here where it says stop ahead, I would say these are a bunch of shotgun houses. Mm -hmm. You know, this, it looks like it. the house with one door, so called, you could shoot a gun and it would go through the, all the rooms at the mm -hmm. same time. Uh, we call them railroad flats in New York. I, too, I also like the angle at which he chose to, uh, to photograph this. Sure, it, it it's, it's, it's almost as like he's in, the, almost in a trench. He's like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. looking, yeah. And it looks like it was, uh, uh, you know, it was a, a sudden decision, you know, yeah. that he heard this band coming. Um, it does seem like he's really captured a moment in time, the way that uh, it, we sort of get the bystander's glimpse of this. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, I guess it, in your language, it's a snapshot, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a snapshot, sure. So, Peter... But it's, to me, it's, it's mm -hmm. just so powerful culturally. Right, right. And oh, I'm wondering if you can you can kind of place this in the context of some of the other uh, your other topics of research pertaining to African American culture, um, specifically migrations. And you you've ta talked a bit about that, I yeah. think, or alluded to that in terms of this tradition coming from West Africa. But um, I know that you've uh, written and published a great deal on on African American migrations. Yeah. So. Um, does this speak to you and along those lines? Well, you know, you think of it, this is, this is the world that Louis Armstrong mm -hmm. came out of. And Louis Armstrong reinvented what jazz in the late, in the mid 1920s. And supposedly the old cliche is it took the river up to Chicago. Yeah. So American jazz comes out of this context. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's really a powerful not just African American moment, but an American moment that's, mm -hmm. that this is all connected with. Yeah. And, and what, what role do you think jazz has played in the civil rights movements of the, the 60s and even extending up to today? I, th I think jazz is a form of celebration. Mm -hmm. And it's a celebration of spontaneity mm -hmm. and improvisation. And in the sense of freedom, mm -hmm. and it makes its own rules. It doesn't follow. It doesn't follow written down kinds of rules. So it's that expression of here and of individual freedom yeah. together. And certainly, the civil rights movement needed that as one of its informing principles. And I think about the way the, the role that music played all together in the civil rights movement. Right. The, um, the freedom singers were, were a group that became partly Sweet Honey in the Rock, mm -hmm. uh, that were part of the civil rights movement of the, of the 1960s. And they dug up traditional African-American songs and played them and sang them. Some of them were church, church songs, which they turned into secular music. Uh, you want me to keep doing blah blah? Anyway, yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> you know, we shall we shall overcome is a restatement of a, a Sea Island, South Carolina church song called "We Will Over We Over We Will Overcome," which is done to hand clapping and foot stomping in a church. It then became a song of the Longshoremen Working Class Union Movement. Oh wow! Mm -hmm. Those people were then taken to this tiny little town in Tennessee called Mount Eagle, where a bunch of folk singers had retreats for working class and civil rights people and became the song 
we'll overcome became we shall overcome became mm -hmm. the anthem of the civil rights movement as it moved from the church to the labor movement to the civil rights movement mm -hmm. in about a 10-year period to, to get back to the significance of um, the um, the Charleston not crossing the, yeah. the legs so what is behind that why can't you cross your legs I think I think when it, when, it, when it was brought by West Africans into the American church, crossing your legs was understood to be kind of blasphemous. Okay. Like making the sign of the cross oh, with your body. Okay. So you're supposed uh -huh. to keep it free of that. Mm -hmm. I, I love what you said about um, the role of jazz in the civil rights movement. What about photography? You know, why do you use photography when you're teaching African American history and your American studies courses? Well, sure. I mean, I try to use images mm -hmm. and, and I love the WPA. I think yeah. I told you about it, that, that, that there's this huge trove of WPA, not mostly 1930 photographs of juke joints and, um, washerwomen and mm -hmm. you know all the gordon park stuff and right there's this just and it's just just incredible and and i don't know if we're going to talk about this but but this is very much a, yeah. to me in the tradition of that yeah could you could you talk a bit about w that this photograph i swear i've walked down that street <laughs> uh I, I and it's because look you can see those high-rise Yes. Those mm -hmm. downtown buildings not far. And the um, World War II Museum is right near there. So mm -hmm. this is like at the center of things. And you've got the remnants of the New Orleans vernacular architecture, the, mm -hmm. the wrought iron. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. by the way, that's also West Africa. Oh, okay. The, uh -huh. the, the, several of the groups in West Africa were iron makers. Mm -hmm. They're M-A-N-D, Mande people. Mm-hmm. And they invented a certain kind of tightly wound scroll as their trademark. And you'll, if you looked in this, you would see those. They almost look like musical uh, signatures. Uh, a, a, a symbol I use a lot is called Sankofa, uh -huh. uh, and uh, which means to go back is correct. But but in in these second story uh you know iron yeah cast yeah. iron mm -hmm. things is, is you'll find lots of remnants of west african mm -hmm. uh, aesthetics it's fascinating i think yeah. and, and you know so this is like a cheap version of bourbon street and where all the jazz stuff is this is right. this is a much more rundown part of if, i think if you walked up two or three blocks and turned right it would be all of the famous clubs and mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. like that so this was taken in 65, yeah. and this is by Leonard Freed. Okay, um, who I don't know at all. But. And it, I think what's really um, one of the many striking things about this is the uh, sign, which says service yes, for colored. Yes, that's, that's what I kind of yeah. wanted mm -hmm. to address. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, I don't, you, you may admit, New Orleans had three categories of people until the turn of the 20th century. Okay. There were whites, there were blacks, and there were what were called gens de couleur libre, free men, mm -hmm. free people of color. Right. So there was a third, uh, I don't like that word, mulatto, quadroon category of Creole mm -hmm. people. And when the South was revoked all of the reform from Reconstruction and reinstituted black, black codes and Jim Crow laws. Yes. They did away with that people, free people of color category. So to me, this is an interesting testimony of the end of that, you know, service for colored. They're not saying service for people of color. They're saying for anybody who ain't white. Mm -hmm. And, and and that other group ceased to exist around 1910 or so. Okay. So just my little piece of trivia. So, so the most profound legislative moment or constitutional moment 
uh, you may or may not, it's called Plessy versus Ferguson, mm -hmm. which the Supreme Court of the United States in 1894 ruled that segregation, separate but equal, was constitutional. Yes. And Plessy was a New Orleans man mm -hmm. who was denied a seat on a train. And Plessy versus Ferguson was reversed in the school board decision of 1954. So to mm -hmm. me, this is a remnant of, of that as well. Right. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense. Yes, it does. It okay. does, because this was in 1965, so yeah. well after yeah. Brown right. versus the Board right. of Education. Yeah, it's, only, it's less than 10 years after. Yeah. But, but so mm -hmm. there we are. New Orleans is still doing that, but, you know. Yeah. If it were a school, it would be against the law. But of course, the right. South resisted all of this anyway. Mm -hmm. Right, right. This is a, a very so strong a, document so it's, of it's, that. It's, inter it's an interesting symbol and remnant of what New, Lo New Orleans stood for in terms of race relations. Mm -hmm. And that connects back to the civil rights movement in an in indirect way. Free men of color meant they could exercise rights which is what the civil rights movement was trying to establish. Right. A lot of the civil rights movement was a trying to pass on to the black population the rights of free men of color, mm -hmm. which were now erased by the end of uh, that, that period of history. Right. So it's, so it's the free, free people of color moment is a kind of precursor to civil rights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. And back to, see, that takes me back to my favorite place, which is Char Charleston, because Charleston had an important labor movement. Mm -hmm. And the labor movement was also a precursor to the civil rights movement. Right. In, in, so the, these things all go in. And I'd love to see if there were some photographs of some of the dock worker strikes in Charleston, um, which were Gullah people mm -hmm. who were speaking their own, in the sense, of the indigenous language. Mm-hmm and a very important in the history of Charleston. The basket weavers, if you've ever been there, are, are Gullah, who have a separate language and culture. Still. Yeah. So, so, so the wonderful thing about places like Charleston and New Orleans is how uniquely distinct their cultures are. Right. And they yes. are more different <laughs> from each other than they are from the rest of us. <laughs> and that's what's amazing to do, to, to work in the South. The South is not... Yeah a single place, it's many, many places.